Thank you all for being here. Thank you all who served. Thank you all who were families of those who served. And everyone else who cares about the people that this war affected. We're here today to talk about another aspect of the war, which is the Allied participation, the people that the United States troops fought alongside and, and, and for. And so we have a d distinguished group of panelists who will talk about, in turn, the South Vietnamese participation. It was, after all, a sovereign country, and that's why we were there. The South Korean contribution, the Thai military forces, and then I will stand in to talk about the Australian and New Zealand forces. Dr. Bob Hall from Australia couldn't make the 22-hour flight. I don't really blame him that much. Uh, at any rate, he couldn't be here, so I will speak about the Anzacs because I have done a lot of research myself. My name is Dr. Eric B. Villard. I'm from the U.S. Army Center of Military History here in Washington, D.C. Started in year 2000, and I have been a Vietnam War historian for all those 23 years, and will be for the rest of my career. I'm a digital historian as well, but a Vietnam War historian is always going to be closest to my heart. So what I'll do is I will introduce the speakers in turn and have them give a short presentation on the respective contributions of those forces. So first up, I'd like to welcome Dr. She just got her PhD. Dr. Carrie Wynn. From Texas Tech University, and we actually have Texas Tech in the, in the room here. They, they, they Vietnam Center and Archive is by far the best online repository of Vietnam material in the world. Check them out. Incredible people, incredible resources. So, Carrie, if you tell us a little about the South Vietnamese. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is my immense honor to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Nguyen Hong Uyên, and I go by Carrie. I earned my PhD in military history last year from Texas Tech University. My father, Nguyen Văn Nhân, served in the Army and fought alongside many of his American advisors or Go Vân Mỹ, as we said in Vietnamese. I study the U.S. Army advisory effort in Vietnam, especially the experiences of the mobile advisory team, or MAD, who lived 24-7 with the Vietnamese allies and risked their lives fighting alongside their counterparts in many rural villages in South Vietnam, providing daily support, assistance, and training to the local unit, um, including the ethnic minority, Montagna, the Hmong, the Vietnamese territorial unit, like the regional forces, popular forces, and people self-defense forces. Like other advisory programs from, from other branches of service, uh, such as the Marine, they had the combined action platoons. Um, the US Navy also had a program called Pigs and Chicken, um, in order to support and allow the Vietnamese sailors and their family to raise farm animals on the base for either consumption or to sell at the local markets. MAT teams play a central role in helping the local Vietnamese allied people with everything. You can think of everything from delivering birth to babies, pulling abscess teeth, to dig digging wells, building schools and bridges, diversify the crop so the peasant and local farmer, they can learn how to grow mint, cilantro, in addition to their rice crop and sell it at the local market. And so many more programs in order to help the local villagers that they can have a safer and better life amidst a brutal war. Um, in this panel, I would like to share with you two stories from my research that I think they encapsulate the meanings of alliance between the American and the South Vietnamese people. The first story is of Steve Layton, who served on MACV Advisory Team 51 in Ba Suing province in 1967. He became very close friend with Captain Long, um, his local counterparts. When the aircraft took Steve Layton 
Al of Bakliu village. At the end of his tour, he already knew that he, he had a very special human bond. Um, about 45 minutes into the flight, when they announced on the speaker that we are now clear of Vietnam airspace, Steve Hart was sinking. He said that I felt like these guys were my brothers and I had gone home and left them behind. For many years after the war, Steve and his wife had tried to fight long um, and they even went back to Vietnam, but it was in vain. Little did they know that Long and Steve family, they both live in the same city of Minneapolis. And they even shop at the same local Asian grocery store called the United Noodles. Um, they finally reunited after 40 years. Long daughter Annie was going to school at the University of Minnesota. And their family live in a very small apartment in an unsafe neighborhood. Steve and his veteran friend uh, supported Long family to move to a house in a safer uh, neighborhood. And Annie was so happy to have her own room and her own bed for the first time because she had never slept on a bed since she came to America after her father got out of the re-education camp. So what does being an ally or having an ally means? Steve said that Long and other South Vietnamese soldiers had become his family. And he said, it is hard for people that have not been in combat together to understand this special bond that is formed by doing so. We were willing to die for each other if necessary. But the good news is we live for each other as we all gather here to honor and express our deep gratitude to many Vietnam veterans and welcome them home. I know that many of you have been trying your best to find your Vietnamese counterpart to help them, to welcome them and their family to their new home in America. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for giving that loving kindness and human warmth and compassion to other people when you yourself did not receive it, when you first came home, you give what you didn't receive because I believe that you must already have it from within yourself. The second story is about a beautiful woman by the name of Sue Ann Kahn's. She is a member of the Son and Daughter in Touch. Her father, Leslie Roy Kahn's, left in August 1970 after celebrating his daughter's sixth birthday for a second tour in Vietnam. Um, Leslie served on a mobile advisory team 102 in King Ang District with MACV advisory team 55. Leslie sent home a blue sky color ao yai for his little daughters. Um, you know, something that's similar to the Vietnamese dress that I'm wearing right now. Only 19 days away from coming home, on February 16, 1971, Leslie got into an ambush along the thick foliage and intricate waterways in the Umin Forest. After finished the inspection of the construction of the popular Fox outpost, while bleeding profusely and being exposed to enemy fire and B-40 rocket, Leslie still tried to maneuver the boat to cover and by doing that, giving his two other teammates on the same boat their only chance to survive. But Leslie Roy Kahn's did not survive. He died that same day in that wet, cold, and darkness of the forlorn mangrove forest in the Mekong Delta. Leslie never get to give his daughter Sue Ann another hug on her seventh birthday. Sue and I, we actually just met each other last week um, at a counterpart reunion in South Dakota. Someone told Sue that go talk to that Vietnamese student. She studied about mobile advisory team. And she came to me, talked to me, because she wanted to learn more about what her father did in Vietnam. You know, I, I always think that I have a passion for learning history growing up. But when I met Sue and I was reminded about the beauty and resilience of human spirit. And that, I am being a historian for a reason. 
that is much bigger than myself, much bigger than a PhD degree, a job, something you know, that bigger than a war in my country. My father stayed back in 1975 to support his elderly mom who could not run and pass away when I was 14 years old. I miss him every day. Those of you who, who lost a loved one, you understand. You know that open gap in your heart that it never fully closed. You grieve and you grow around it. But I cannot even begin to imagine the loss and the ultimate sacrifice that many Gold Star family and Gold Star children like Sue and have to make for serving their country, for serving the United States of America. And we are gathering here today for this Welcome Home National Event. Please keep a space in your hearts to remember and honor the memory of those like Sue and father who never get to go home, to all Vietnam veterans and all of the allies and all of the families who also serve. Thank you so much for your service. Welcome home. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Our next speaker will be talking about the South Korean participation. Dr. Hoseb Shim is an assistant professor, Department of Military History, the Korea Military Academy, and flew two days ago <laughs> from. And so the fact that he's here, good on you. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm doing the Anzac thing, sorry. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Shim will tell us a little about the experience of the South Koreans in the Vietnam War, but being a, a, a military person himself, I think some insights on how Korean, South Korean society looks at uh, the veterans. And some things are similar and some things are a little different from us. Hello, everyone. My name is Ho Sup. And uh, thank you for coming here. And it's my big honor to talk about the South Koreans' participation in the Vietnam War to all of, you, all of you, and welcome home. And even though the United States is not my home, but I feel like I'm, this is my home because I was here for five years to take my PhD degree, and it was like a, three years ago. And then I flew in just two days ago, and I leave tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like it's warm is here, and then so happy to uh, talk something about the South Koreans' participation to you. But what I want to let you know is that South Korea is very significant allied troops with South Vietnam and United States. And just want to let you know that please remember that South Korea was in Vietnam. OK? Yeah. And what I want to first start this topic is, after I finished my PhD, I came back to Korea, and I started my career. Uh, and even though I wrote like five articles about the South Korea's conduct and participation in the Vietnam War, it's very hard for me to talk about this topic to public or to academics in South Korea because scholars, mostly the civilians, doesn't want to hear that South Korean forces or rock forces or rock army did something good in Vietnam. And the military doesn't want me to talk something bad or something wrong that military did in Vietnam. So I had no position to, why should I talk? But as a historian and as a military officer, I really want to break through and really want to talk what actually happened in Vietnam. And that's what I'm seeking for. And in terms of that, I'm really happy that I can show that I have a passion and I think I have a responsibility that somebody now talk about that because 
Rock Army or South Korean Army itself is a forgotten army in South Korea. Now people don't remember that we did and we participated in Vietnam and that actually contributed a lot to South Korea, especially for their economy or their national interest. And what did veterans did, they really sacrificed but people don't remember, and they themselves become a forgotten presence. And in terms of that, I, I know that U.S. veterans also had that kind of, in terms of long time, and now you have a, like this big ceremony and event, and I really wish that South Korean veterans had have this kind of event in some times, and if that happens, I wanna contribute. So nowadays, I'm going around and meet Korean veterans and doing some interviews to them and what really happened to them. And I think that is really kind of be my job in South Korea. And I just want to let you know that South Korea sent, like, are we going to talk later? Oh, you mean yeah, how many? South yeah. Korea? Okay, yeah. 320,000 troops overall for 10 years and which is the second largest foreign presence in Vietnam after the United States. And in a year, we were like 50,000 with two army divisions and one marine brigade with non-combatant troops. And that's a huge number, especially thinking about the South Korean's economy at the time was very poor and then then why you think South Korea sent so many troops to Vietnam? And even after the Vietnamization started then US ground troops withdrew, and especially the almost most of them are gone in 1972, but South Korean ground troops still remained until 1973. And why South Korea did that? And I wanna let you know their main motivations, and especially the government decided, and society and public supported that. Even the South Koreans now don't want to admit that we supported the troops to send. But when I look at that, it was a fever, like a patriotism or like a adventures that the poor South Koreans now going out to abroad and help somebody who is struggling that we had like a twin 10 or 15 years ago in, during the Korean War. So South Korean government actually wanna kind of seek national interest and they, they focus on the security issues because they're ally, ally, ally of the United States and in terms of alliance, they don't wanna, the US troops in South Korea withdrew. withdrew. So they wanna prevent, prevent that. And also they wanna gain lots of the military budgets and also the military benefits, but as well as they want to gain economic benefits a lot. And also President Park, Park Chung-hee at the time want to, to strengthen his regime and sending troops to Vietnam actually helped him to strengthen his power in South Korea. And then people actually supported it. The, government, the Congress supported it, and when I saw the first dispatch troops leave, left Busan port, so over 100,000 people gathered and like a cheers, and when, before they left, they had a parade in Seoul, and it's million people gathered. At the time, the, only the population was three million, so even though it was like a force to go, but I saw lots of cheers there. So people actually felt patriotism when they sent troops to Vietnam. But what I argue is that that kind of patriotism and kind of motivation declined as the Vietnam War last, especially in terms of the relationship with the United States in 1968 and 1969 and something happened in Korea, and the Nixon Doctrine, he actually withdrew troops 
the US second division from seventh division from South Korea, and the Vietnamization started. South Koreans, there's almost no like a leverage because it was a big leverage to talk with the United States, sending troops to Vietnam was. But now US decided to withdraw. So only the motivation left was economic motivations. And even that happened to soldiers. So in terms of that, when war progressed, South Koreans' morale and discipline went down. And this is really hard for me to argue in South Korea. But as soon as I saw the South Koreans won of the biggest battle, Battle of Anke Pass in 1972 against North Vietnamese East Offensive, South Koreans' performance was very terrible in terms of that. But I have to admit it. And I just want to argue three things in terms of South Koreans' participation. And South Korean forces was actually very much like a political army in terms of political army because they went to Vietnam as U.S. ally and South Vietnamese ally, but we had our own national interest. And the Korean government want their troops to keep casualties down. But as a field commander, Korean field commander, they knew the relationship with the U.S. and South Vietnamese army is very important, especially with the U.S. forces, because U.S. forces support everything to Koreans, and they know keeping the alliance strong is also very important. So what the Korean military or Korean forces said their goal was gain maximum results, results, gains, with minimum efforts. That's very hard, isn't it? But they achieved it in some sense. And what could they, what factors that they achieved this was that their strategy was pacification. And even they didn't follow the US, the operation style like search and destroy. They built like a company base and they focus on the pacification and which I think is very defensive in some sense. But in during, with doing that, they avoid big battles with Viet Cong or those Vietnamese forces because their operational area was also relatively safe compared to others. And South Korean, in terms of that, they focus on small ta tactics and they show that, oh, South Koreans are really doing good. We are really capable partners, and in some sense, they achieved their results. And it's also interesting that South Koreans didn't, didn't do any body counts, but they also did that uh, when they achieved, oh, what did you achieve? Oh, I count lots of rifles. But in terms of that, after their morale went down, South Koreans involved lots of in black markets in terms of in bad stuff. So anyway, I want to argue that South Koreans were political army focusing on their own national interest. And also they want to face, they want to keep their face with South Vietnam and the United States. And my second ar argument, during the Vietnam War, South Korean army actually became a capable military, even though they were good. And they were admitted as a capable partner during the Korean War. But in Vietnam, during the Vietnam War, their army became modernized, having lots of new weapons like M16s or helicopters and everything. And they learned lots of things from the United States with the com combined operations. And also like uh, the many, many battles they actually did in Vietnam. And they learned a lot. But that kind of lessons didn't went well after the Vietnam War because they think that this is very excep exceptional, the lesson they learned because like the United States, South Korean army also focused on the big battles like a conventional style of war, not like the, the unconventional style of war in Vietnam. And my last question argument is why 
Vietnam War became the forgotten war in South Korea is because people knew even during the Vietnamization, this war is unsuccessful war. And in terms of that, they have a shame that we went to Vietnam for our own <laughs> interest in some, some sorts of that. Even soldiers felt like that. Oh, But soldiers went to Vietnam to raise their family because they are, most of them are poor. And I wanted my little brother and little sister to go make them to study. And I want to make my family you know, just, just like a normal family and some kind of that. But why Koreans forgotten? Because I think it's most of that point is the, because of the politics. And President Park was assassinated. And the military regime was gone. But even then, the military regime was gone. It's another military coup and regime. And people criticized what military regime did in terms of their you know, policies. And there's a democratic boom in South Korea, and they criticized and down, looked down that what the decisions President Park made, especially sending troops to Vietnam. And also at the time, anti-American you know, happened in Korea, and it was not a good decision. It was just following the imperialism of the United States mood. So that kind of things made an argument that Koreans did very bad things in Vietnam, like a massacre and everything, and that kind of stories went on. And militaries didn't, or scholars who say that we did something good in Vietnam too, didn't say anything about that. And they actually avoided that kind of topics. And veterans got angry. <laughs> So people saw veterans, what they are doing, and they're just angry and say nothing about that. And especially in terms of that kind of gulf between bad war and good war, I think it's a big lift and gulf. And there's no story, historical research about what South Koreans actually did in Vietnam. And that's what I'm trying to do from now on. And thank you for listening to me and welcome home. Thank you. So our third speaker is Dr. Richard A. Ruth, a professor at United States Naval Academy, so he's pretty local. Uh, and he's going to be here to talk about the Thai involvement in the Vietnam War. Good morning. Thank you. And thank you, Eric, for putting together the panel today. And, and thanks to my fellow panelists. Thank you for the veterans, uh, for all that you've done and that you continue to do. And thank you to everybody who here, who's here today. Um, I've written about Thailand's participation in the Vietnam War. I wrote a monograph about it a few years ago and, and a few articles here and there. Uh, but for the sake of brevity uh, this morning, I wanted to take some notes from a general history of Thailand that I wrote that kind of gives an outline of their participation with a focus on the Thai soldiers who served. And uh, yeah, just I'll say Thailand was a, a frontline state in this regional war. I won't focus on Laos, I'm just going to go right to South Vietnam. So. In January of 1967, uh, about a year and a half after the United States had started putting large combat units in, into South Vietnam, Bangkok agreed to send a token force uh, to fight there. And initially, they agreed to send a specially created unit of about 2,000 volunteers who would represent Thailand uh, in South Vietnam alongside the other countries uh, that we're featuring today, uh, the so-called free world nations. Uh, the Thais agreed to only send what was a regiment-sized unit first, and Thailand's military leadership feared that uh, if they'd sent too large an, of an expeditionary force, uh, especially one that consisted of their most valuable and highly trained career army units, they would become vulnerable to the communist insurgents that were operating in their own country in the Northeast. They also were afraid that if they'd sent too many uh, soldiers, this would alarm uh, Beijing and Hanoi, uh, at the time, as probably most of you know, uh, Thailand was hosting American B-52s, 
uh, out of Utapau Air Base and other uh, and, and other aircraft out of uh, various Thai air bases throughout the country, um, bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, so Thailand was really uh, trying to be discreet uh, during this period. Now the special unit the Thai sent was called the Queen's Cobras Unit, or the Queen's Cobras. Uh, it's a name that alludes both to an earlier Thai troop commitment, these were the uh, Tigers that they sent to South Korea, uh, and also to Queen Sirikit, who was the honorary commander of the volunteers. Now this unit was uh, uh, a special unit. The Royal Thai Army wanted soldiers who had a particular set of qualities. They wanted, uh, they launched this public campaign uh, to encourage soldiers with a high school diploma and previous military experience. Uh, who, would, who would volunteer. There were all these radio announcements and, and uh, uh, newspaper stories about it. And they stressed the voluntary aspect of this participation. These were not draftees, but they wanted soldiers or former soldiers with special skills. Uh, so some of them were ex-military and some of them resigned from their uh, active duty uh, positions to join uh, this unit. And it was hugely popular that I think on the first day that they took uh, or they registered volunteers, some 10,000 men volunteered uh, just on the first day for the, it was really five times the number that they needed. And this went on for days and days and days. Uh, there are many newspaper stories about this and the most sort of common one that you saw from this age showed photos of what were Thai Buddhist monks volunteering to fight in South Vietnam. And the Thai military leadership at the time, I think, were heartened by this conflation of Buddhism with uh, military service against communism. So why did the Thai men fight and uh, why did they volunteer to fight in South Vietnam? And, and this is similar then to probably what we saw in South Korea. Uh, one reason was money that the soldiers received bonuses that were nearly double the money that was paid to them by the Royal Thai Army. Um, this is one of the reasons why the Thai soldiers were later called America's mercenaries, partly because the United States uh, funded this, this bonus. Some did it uh, because that they were interested in uh, travel, that this would be a chance for them to, uh, some had never been on aircraft, they wanted to, to fly in airplanes and go overseas. Some of them were, felt really a complex set of motivations regarding military service, that they wanted to fight in an actual war. They wanted to use the American Armalite rifles, those M16s that they'd started to read about in uh, the Thai press. And uh, they, many of them uh, were interested in status, that if they served in the big event of their day, they would end up uh, with a kind of uh, a, a cultural or social status that, that from serving uh, in the Vietnam War. So the, uh, I'll just say it was a, a huge deal in Thailand when it happened that there were, uh, there were big ceremonies uh, to see them off uh, when they were sent to, to South Vietnam, that the head of the country at the time, Field Marshal Tanom Kitika Chon, uh, address them directly. Even the Supreme Patriarch of Thailand's Buddhist clergy blessed them, which is, as I've pointed out, uh, technically uh, contrary to, to Buddhist tenets. And when they arrived in Saigon at the port, uh, at Newport in Saigon, uh, General Westmoreland was there to greet them. Uh, so it was definitely a, a, a big deal. Uh, the Thai soldiers' destination was Bearcat Camp in Bien Hoa, which was about 40 kilometers or so above Saigon. Uh, this was a former base uh, that had been used by the US 9th Infantry Division earlier. They relinquished it to the Thai troops. It sat beside National Highway number 15. Uh, uh, that's the, uh, part of a stretch of road that went from Bien Hoa down to the port at Vung Tha. And I'll say now the Thai troops saw combat in South Vietnam. I think sometimes this is overlooked especially in the earlier deployments, that they fought the Viet Cong in several battles that engaged the regiment size unit. Uh, now in small, smaller actions, I think they were effective in disrupting the Viet Cong's logistical supply routes in this area and the underground sanctuaries that they, they operated. The Viet Cong tried to knock the Thais out early on in their deployment, uh, that uh, within a month, I think, of the, yeah, within a month of the Queen's Cobras arriving, 
they were attacked by uh, Viet uh, Cong commandos in an effort that I think was meant to deliver a psychological blow and a propaganda victory uh, by trying to overrun uh, a Thai base. Uh, this was uh, at a place called uh, Phuc Tha, or near a village called Phuc Tha. They attacked a Thai field base at night with mortars and rockets and then with waves of uh, commandos, with guerrilla commandos, who attempted to pierce the Thai perimeter. And the Thais fought well there, that with the support of one uh, American C-47 gunship providing uh, firepower from above, the Thais held off the Viet Cong in a five-hour battle that lasted until nearly dawn, with the latter stages involving close-quarter fighting, hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, at the very end. Now, there were other battles like this one in the years to come. A lot of this uh, fighting took place around the airport at uh, Binh Son. Um, and in all of the examples, I'll stress it again, the Thais appear to have fought well. And the Thai press loved these uh, engagements, that they carried stories about them at the time with headlines that were almost like uh, sports scores, that Thais killed 29 Viet Cong, suffer only one dead, uh, that kind of thing, uh, in the first year of, of uh, Thai service in, in South Vietnam. I think there were hundreds of these engagements. Uh, but the rate of contact diminished as the years went on. So one of the things, and this is probably a familiar um, story to, to the veterans here, that, um, but I always wondered if the Thais fought well in South Vietnam, why do they have what's sometimes seen as a negative historical reputation for their service uh, in the Vietnam War? And I think one of the reasons had to do with the kinds of soldiers who were recruited for their later deployments that's Starting in August of 1968, Thailand agreed to commit a larger unit to South Vietnam. So for the next three years, they sent a full-sized combat division of about 11,000 uh, men who were there to replace the Queen's Cobra uh, unit. And this was called the Black Panther Division. Now, so unlike the first group, the subsequent division included soldiers who were less professional uh, in their conduct and in their outlook. Uh, another change probably was the motivation, whereas the first group who went to South Vietnam went without knowing how much uh, compensation they would get. Uh, the second group uh, knew about the, the kind of monetary windfall that could come from serving in South Vietnam, so some of their volunteer service was probably uh, motivated by money. And I will say, and this is part of the topic today, that money was a significant factor in their deployment, that the United States covered the entire cost of putting the Thai troops in South Vietnam. They paid for all the Thai equipment, the transportation, the food, the medical care, and the salaries. And the Royal Thai Army was allowed to keep the equipment that they used in South Vietnam. This was one of the demands that Bangkok uh, had negotiated uh, with Washington. So um, I think all of this extra, uh, including the combat pay on top of regular pay, per diem while in Vietnam, all of the a mustering out bonus that they received as well, all of this contributed to the, the historical reputation uh, of Thai troops uh, as what are sometimes called America's mercenaries, although I, I disagree with the label. Now, and one of the significant uh, problems with the Thai soldiers was their obsession with the PX stores, and I've written about this in articles that the Thais were fascinated with the luxury goods that they could pick up uh, at these American PX stores that these were stereos and cameras and uh, refrigerators and things that would have been prohibitively expensive for soldiers uh, to buy in Thailand because they were imported from the United States or Japan and they carried large uh, customs duties on them. But Thai soldiers in South Vietnam could pick them up uh, uh, really quite cheaply by buying them uh, from PX stores in Saigon. And then there was even a special one at Bearcat Camp I'll just say one of the most popular stories I heard while I was interviewing Thai uh, veterans was that when th the Thai camps were under fire, some Thai soldiers would strip off their uh, flak jackets and throw them over their stereos and their, uh, uh, the goods that they bought because they were afraid of having their, their stuff uh, ruined by a mortar blast. Uh, and I just think this fixation on consumerism is, was seen as off-putting uh, to American journalists, soldiers, and, and observers there. I'll say, too, the Thai troops did not fight al directly alongside Americans. The Thais did have some uh, American liaison officers and translators attached to their units, but mostly they fought independent of uh, the Americans. 
And when they did encounter each other, it was often in a casual or a non-military way. That Thai veterans uh, that I talked to said the American soldiers who they had contact with were not always maybe the best representations of the military. They were sometimes the ones who came looking for uh, to buy drugs uh, and things like that. That the Thai uh, that I, I talked to recalled uh, Americans coming uh, looking for marijuana and harder drugs and things like that. Or they would sometimes ask the Thai soldiers if they could smuggle uh, 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 narcotics back from Thailand uh, when the Thai troops returned from R&R. &R, uh, um, but some of these were, were happier uh, encounters, or I would say maybe more, so, uh, yeah, more professional encounters. The uh, Americans uh, would sometimes ask for Mekong whiskey. If, if some of you know what that is, it's not really a whiskey. Uh, Mekong is a, like a sugar-based, uh, more like a rum that's produced in Thailand that has herbs and uh, uh, other kinds of flavorings in it. You couldn't buy it at a PX stores, but the Thais had it on them, and, and many American veterans who'd served in Thailand uh, would, would, would come see the Thai soldiers and try to buy their Mekong whiskey. And I'll wind up here. But I'll just say the last thing, too, that the, the Thai soldiers uh, recall the Americans being obsessed with were the uh, Buddhist amulets that the Thais wore around their necks. And I've written about this in the past as well, that the, all Thai soldiers carried at least one uh, little Buddhist amulet around their neck. It's usually a small Buddhist statue encased in plastic and a, a metal casing around it. And it was common for Thai soldiers not only to carry one, but some carried dozens on them. Some carried more than 100 uh, on their bodies. And uh, just the sight of these uh, soldiers uh, with all the, the Buddhist symbols on them uh, inspired Americans to ask the Thai soldiers if they could have one for extra protection. And this I, is, was really a source of a huge amount of pride for the Thai soldiers, that they said the Americans wanting a Buddhist amulet uh, lifted their spirits and, and, and had made them proud because initially they said they felt a little embarrassed to wear them into combat because they seemed old-fashioned or they seemed unmodern. But when they met Americans who would say, hey, and this, they remember it in kind of American pigeon. They remember Americans saying, Buddha Thai, number one, or Buddha Thai, very good. Uh, this ended up making them uh, in some ways reassess their own culture and uh, also reassess their, their opinion of the Americans that they met. And I'll wind up here by saying uh, Thailand kept the division in South Vietnam for three years. Uh, the final deployment rotated back home in, uh, in 1972, less than a year before the United States took out the last of its combat troops. Uh, in total, about 40,000 Thai troops from the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force served there. Uh, more than 500 of them died uh, while serving in South Vietnam, uh, and many more uh, suffering uh, injuries and, and, and uh, ca other kinds of casualties. Um, I I'll say I'm not sure the Thai contribution changed much in terms of the war significantly, but the Thai military experience in South Vietnam and in Laos uh, had lingering and profound effects on Thailand's politics, Thailand's military, and really on to Thai society uh, for the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I am going to speak about the Australian and New Zealand contribution, and hopefully I will do them right. Uh, but I will say a few personal comments about why I am going to speak on the topic, uh, because I've had a long relationship with the ANZAC uh, veterans and historians. Really uh, kind of put the hook into me when I was an undergraduate at Occidental College. I got a fellowship. So in 1989, I went to Australia for nine weeks and traveled around the country and interviewed Australian, New Zealand, Vietnam veterans. And I still have those micro cassettes in my basement. I need to digitize them. But it was an incredible experience. Um, Women as well as men, some some um, some indigenous uh, veterans, a whole variety of people, and just loved the country, loved the people. And uh, if if I wasn't going to be a Vietnam historian by that point, well, I sure was afterwards. So that that was an early introduction, and uh, and since then I've written a number of papers about the Anzacs. 
I went to Canberra in 2015 to talk to the Australian Army Chief of Staff Conference, which was an incredible experience. And uh, Dr. Jeffrey Gray and Peter Dennis, two fantastic historians and great human beings, when I first started working at CMH and started going to academic conferences, like, and you know, I didn't know anybody. And like, oh my God, that's so-and-so, you know, all these people that you've been reading and like they're there in the room. These two guys who were eminent historians in their own right, but just, you know, the greatest people just took time to talk to me. And it just made that experience so much better. Um, Dr. Duffer Gray unfortunately passed um, a few years ago from a heart attack, but I still thank him for what he did. So that's kind of a little backstory for me. So, say a little first about Australia and New Zealand's military traditions. So as you know, both Australia and New Zealand were colonized by Great Britain. Now there were, of course, indigenous people already living there, still are. So uh, it's not like they were discovered, it's just that a bunch of white people came over and started living there. Um, so these two were British colonies, but um, around the turn of the century is when both Australia and New Zealand started making real contributions. It was actually the Boer War in South Africa. How many people see in the movie Breaker Morant? Oh, great film. See it, but that's about Australian light horse cavalry. But so the Australian New Zealanders contributed to this war against the Afrikaners in South, Af South Africa. In World War I, both New Zealand and Australia contributed a, for their population, which was quite small, a huge number of troops and fought in Europe, in World War I, in the trenches. And in fact, um, the Australians and New, Ze New Zealanders fought alongside several U.S. divisions in, in the Somme area. So th there's that relationship going back. But then World War II, of course, you know, like all hands to the oars, it was that kind of crisis. The amount of people that Australia and New Zealand mobilized is astonishing, you know, and they're sending full divisions to North Africa. But in the Pacific, it was particularly, again, the U.S. The relationship with the Australians and New Zealand was critical because it was Australia, right, when MacArthur and the remnants of his troop retreat from the Philippines, they go to Australia. Australia becomes the springboard for the liberation of the Southwest Pacific. So there's a, there's a, there was a long relationship between the U.S. and these two countries, even while they were still part of the British Commonwealth. Uh, the British Commonwealth is, um, again, after Great Britain, the empire began dissolving, they created this new federation, which still exists, um, of former colonies. But after World War I, when Britain's power really began to shrink, that's when Australia and New Zealand, or in New Zealand really began to establish a much closer relationship with the United States. So, you know, what were the, and I'll just use the word Anzac. Um, and the word Anzac, which is a term which kind of collectively refers to the Australians and New Zealanders, it actually dates back to World War I. So the Australian and New Zealand Corps, right? It was formed in Egypt in 1914, but critically, it, the Corps, which was both Australian and New Zealand troops, fought in the Gallipoli campaign. Now, if there's a national touchstone for the spirit of Australian New Zealand or, you know, and, and national memory and veterans, it's, it's the Gallipoli campaign. So that searing experience of the Anzac Corps you know, both forged that relationship between the two countries, but also had a continued a tradition. So even though the Corps was disbanded, uh, it came back briefly in World War II, but that's the term we use. So it means both Australian and New Zealanders fighting, fighting together. As I said, after World War II, as Britain withdraws from its empire, suddenly, you know, you've got Australia and New Zealand in this big Pacific, you know, uh, theater, large countries, small populations, with a lot of other neighbors, much more populous neighbors, mostly to the north, and not all of them friendly. So almost right out of the gate, in 1948, there's a communist insurgency in the country of Malaya. So Australia and New Zealand send troops with the Brits 
to fight this communist insurgency, which they're, they're sort of backed by China, communist China. And that lasts until 1960. So there's 12 years where the Australians and New Zealanders are getting really good at jungle warfare. And then there's the Indonesian emergency in Borneo, where there's clashes there in the early 60s. So by the time the Vietnam War really heats up, the Australians and New Zealanders are some of the best trained jungle fighters in the world. And uh, one of the veterans I, I interviewed, he was telling me about the, the training program before he went to South Vietnam. And he especially talked about this place called Canungra, which was a uh, jungle warfare school. And he said, that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I, you know, I spent a whole year in Vietnam. That was easy in comparison to Canungra. So, you know, they had one focus, you know, in this period. They weren't going to go to Europe. They weren't going to go. They were going to fight in places like this, so they got very good at it. So when, when the Vietnam War begins heating up, the United States begins sending conventional troops in 1965. The discussions are going on. America's looking for allies. You know, show the flags. And Australia and New Zealand um, both agree that they are going to contribute, again, because they want a closer alliance with the United States, and also they want a bulwark against communist expansion. Right, particularly the Chinese, and so there's obviously a national self-interest, but I mean, nothing wrong with that. I mean, it ma makes perfect sense. And so they, they agree to send forces. Uh, initially, Australia sends the first RAR, which is the 1st Battalion Royal Australian Regiment. So bat infantry, infantry Battalion, June 65, and it operates in the area just east of Saigon, around Benoit. And it actually operates as, as a maneuver battalion with the 173rd Airborne Brigade. So that was one of the first units the United States had, you know, an elite paratrooper unit. But the, this Australian battalion was, was functioning like a part of this American paratrooper battalion. So for the first year, they were doing a lot of uh, operations in the area just to kind of get a feel for, you know, what the environment was like and getting intelligence and and and... At the end of that tour, Australia decides that they're going to up their commitment. So they create the first Australian task force, the, the 1ATF. And so this is a brigade-sized unit. So they're expanding the number of troops they send. Uh, New Zealand contributes at its maximum strength. We're looking at it's a reinforced brigade, so, you know, close to 12,000. So you basically have three, three infantry battalions, uh, a cavalry squadron, armored cavalry squadron, a tank, they call it a tank a squadron, it's, we would call it a battalion anyway, but it's a tank battalion sized unit um, and, and a number of like, uh, artillery regiments. The New Zealanders of course being a smaller nation so they contribute like an artillery company and an infantry company but they're there. It's mostly Australians but the New Zealanders are there and then they have other units like um, they have the SAS uh, they're elite reconnaissance forces. Um, the Air Force, they have a bomber squadron and a Huey squadron. The Navy has several ships like the Hobart. So it's, you know, it's a big, it's a big effort. And they decide, Australia and New Zealand decide, that they're, they're going to operate basically in one province, Cooktoy province, which is southwest of Saigon, partly because it's right there with the port of Vung Tau, so they can easily sustain those units. Um, it's also in an area that is largely Viet Cong and guerrilla. I mean, there are some NVA units, but it's, it's more of a guerrilla-style war, which is, that's what the Australians do best, right? Small unit patrolling and that kind of thing. So it seemed like a good place. So, so they said, okay, we're going to operate here. Now, they took their orders from the American Two Field Force headquarters, Although there, the term is OPCON, operational control. Basically, when the American Two Field Force said, here's what we're going to do, they, you know, Roger, we're going to do that, they could say no if they wanted to. I mean, they still were a sovereign nation. And so uh, they still had you know, their independence. But basically, they operated as a part of, of the American forces. And so much so, and this is one of the papers I did, because the Australians didn't have all the units they needed, the Americans attached a self-propelled howitzer battalion 
to them, the second and the 35th. And I interviewed a lot of these guys, and they fought under the Australians. And, and these Americans became more Australian than the Australians in some cases. I mean, they, they would put the red kangaroo on their vehicle and drink Fosters, you know, I mean, they loved it. Uh, and particularly, like I said, they, they, there was a kinship, like the, the guys from Texas and the guys from Queen, you know, they got on like gangbuster because they sort of, you know, the cowboy mentality. Um, so the relationship between it was, was very close, very friendly. Sometimes the accent and the slang got in the way because, you know, the Aussies do have certain expressions that m mystify the Americans. But overall, um, the two got along very well. And again, it was one of the closest relationships. They were fighting really as a part of, of the American forces. Now, the Australians also stayed there quite long. Um, they, you know, they were, the, their, their last combat troops actually left in March of 72. So, I mean, they stayed the duration, um, not, not as many. Um, but they were there, um, you know, a, a major commitment. But coming home, their experiences were much like American veterans. Most people didn't want to hear about it. It was an unpopular war. Um, let's just move on. There was also some tension because there were like, during the war there were um, like that postal strike. So the soldiers weren't mail. So one of the things, a common expression of the soldiers over there was punch a posty when you go home. So, <laughs> A post guy, you know, because they were on strike. Uh, so anyway, there was, there's all those tensions as well. Um, so the arc has kind of been the same as our, when I went in 87, they were just starting to turn the corner and they were just having the parades and just starting to welcome home. And so, you know, it, it's gotten better, but um, in, in a lot of ways, I think there was a real kinship and a similar type of experience. But just want to say that, you know, there's some of the best people that I've ever met and they remain close to to many of them, and um, I'm just very, very honored to have these spoken about them on their behalf. Thank you very much. We have uh, just a few minutes uh, if you want to have questions at the microphone, but all of us will be available afterward if you have want to talk to us um, in person. Um, again, we will be available to speak to whoever, but there is a microphone here if you would like to pose a question uh, for the group in the time we have remaining. I see someone coming up. Thank you all, is that on? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you all so much for doing this conference. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I had a question for the Koreans because we at Vietnam Vets of America, we have a lot of, we have uh, Korean veterans that have joined our organization now in a supplemental way, but uh, they've been with us for years and we finally got them to be members at some level. What I was wondering about was when the Koreans came home, do you have any kind of monuments about the Vietnam War that the Koreans were in, in Seoul? Do you have any? I've never been to Seoul. Yeah, one. Thank you for your question. Well, compared to the Korean War Memorial, we say, I can say no. But in Seoul, there's a kind of Korean War Memorial, which is really big. But inside of Memorial, we have small part of our the Vietnam War Memorial, but it's very small portion. But yeah, there's almost no memorial for we remember the Vietnam War. Do you talk about it in the classroom with the history for young kids? Is there a part with the Vietnam War? Is that listed in there? Well, after back, I wanted to uh, open the class for the Vietnam War, but it was impossible in some sense because it doesn't want me to teach about the Vietnam War and some stuff. So we teach the Vietnam War uh, as a part of the world warfare, ah. but in, I talk like five minutes <laughs> about the Koreans in the Vietnam War in that class. And my, my last question was, do the veterans that fought there, do they have compensation for the um, 
service-related illnesses that we are getting. A VVA has worked so hard for 50 years to get compensation for the 30 plus uh, diseases that we all got related to Agent Orange. How about for the Korean and maybe all of the different? Do they? Do you have compensation for them for illnesses? Hmm. Do you want to do that first? You want to do that first? Well, <laughs> I really want to do that in some sense, but when I, s I, for me, it's really hard to estimate them because their experience is totally different. And I don't know what kind of struggle they had in um, all the sense, but most of them are very silent and doesn't want to talk much about their experience to even to their family. Yeah, so, and the death illness people, they are just suffering, but doesn't want to talk about their experience. So we don't know what kind of struggle they had. But government actually paid, but it's really small. So I really want to say it's only like $100 per month, but it's really small, and we have to change. In some sense, we have, if you want to commemorate, commemorate their struggle, we should, yes. Sure, I, I would say, yeah, the Thais themselves did, um, they have access to veterans hospitals and they take part in uh, health insurance schemes that are made uh, somewhat available for uh, Thai veterans of that generation, I'm sorry, military veterans of that generation. But without me studying it closely, all I can say is it didn't seem adequate to the kinds of health problems and the kinds of all the other um, challenges that they faced especially as they got older and um, uh, were, were less able to, to work or to care for themselves. Um, and I think it is a matter of national pride. They don't necessarily like to talk to me about it. But I sensed from conversations with a lot of them that they wanted to see more care for the Thai veterans. Uh, uh, even if they said, I'm doing OK, all of them had stories of, of uh, friends, cohorts, colleagues who weren't doing well and could use more uh, assistance, health uh, healthcare, psychological assistance and that kind of thing. So it exists, but I really had a strong feeling uh, it, it wasn't adequate for all that they were facing. Thank you for being here and listening and uh, we will be here to talk to you afterwards. We've run out of time. We've got to clear out for the next uh, group to come in, but again, Thank you, everyone, and for all the veterans out there, thank you, and welcome home.